any committee on education. Uh, this is our first meeting for the 2022 uh, legislative session, so I do call this meeting to order. Um, Mariah, if you would, please call the roll. Senator Carroll. Here. Senator Gibbons. Here. Senator Harper Angel. Senator Higdon. Senator Kerr. Senator Meredith. Here. Senator Neal. Senator Southworth. Senator Stivers, Senator Thomas, Senator Wilson, Here. Senator West, Here. Chair Wise, Present. Thank you all so much. We do have a quorum, so we're duly constituted to do business today. Uh, I do see that Senator Neal is making his way in. He'll also be counted present uh, in roll call as well. We do have some introductions I would like to make before we get started this morning with the bills that are on the agenda. I first want to introduce our staff that will be with us from the Education Committee uh, for this legislative session. To my left, Mr. Joshua Collins, also Joe Carroll Ellis, uh, Ms. Lauren Bush, Ms. Yvette Perry, and also to my right, Mariah Allen. And then also would like to recognize our intern that will be working with us this legislative session. That's Ms. Valerie Roberts. Uh, Valerie's a junior at Transylvania University. Uh, she's planning a career in education, majoring in political science, uh, and also uh, education with the folks on middle school math and history. So looking forward to have you with us, but also looking forward to your future pathway ahead uh, in the education field. So thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I do ask if you have cell phones uh, in the audience, please mute those or turn those to silence uh, if you can do so, uh, as well as our committee members uh, for today's agenda. Any members wishing to make any introductions this morning? Introduce any special guests that we have? Seeing none, we'll proceed directly to our business of today. We have two bills that are on the agenda for today for consideration. Uh, the first I will call is Senate Bill 1. It's an act relating to school councils. The sponsor of the bill is Senator John Schickel. Senator Schickel, I'm not sure what guest you may have with you today that wish to be with you at the table, but I invite you to the, to the table, sir, for your introduction of yourself for the record, and then also for your guest when they make their way, if they would identify themselves and uh, introduce themselves for the record as well. Good morning. Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee, thank you for taking time today to hear Senate Bill 1. This bill is not new to you. It's been a work in progress for many years, seven years to be exact. Thanks to you, Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, we've heard testimony on this bill or a var variation of this bill four or five different times. The bill is very simple. As the years have gone by, I think the, the need for this bill has become more and more apparent to our citizens and to the people who work in our school system. It has to do with accountability and who is accountable for our educational system. We have achieved fairly good consensus over the last six years that our current system of school governance is dysfunctional. And with the importance of the education of our children being really probably our number one priority as it should be, and also the constitutional responsibility of the Kentucky General Assembly to pay for that education, that's unacceptable. I'm happy to report today that we've reached good consensus on this bill. And what this bill does is two things. It puts the hands of things like curriculum, or I should say of curriculum, let me be very direct. It puts the final say about curricul curriculum with the citizens of the community. 
Now, why do I say this? I say it because, of course, we hire a professional, a superintendent, to run our school systems. But the elected school board, and I have uh, a very distinguished uh, school, former school board members can testify, and also the, um, who is former president of the school board association can testify. It's a school board that's elected by all the citizens of the community. And at the end of the day, it's a superintendent who we hold accountable for the performance of our schools. So in curriculum and principal selection, the two most important things of whether an individual school succeeds or not will be in the hands of the people who pay and have their children go to that, those, that school system. The parents, the most important, obviously. But it's important to recognize that everyone pays for schools, grandparents, brothers, sisters, people without children. The whole community pays for schools, and it's the whole community which the school board represents. At this time, I'm going to ask this distinguished panel to introduce themselves and uh, proceed with their testimony. Thank you for having us. And on behalf of the Kentucky Association of School Superintendents, I'd like to give you my thoughts. Uh, I'm Dr. Sally Sugg. I'm the superintendent in Shelby County Public Schools. And I do have a unique perspective. I've been working in education for over 40 years. And during that time, I have served as a high school teacher, middle school teacher. I've been an elementary principal. I've been a high school principal. I've been selected by three different councils in three different districts. And also, I served uh, in a brief retirement stint for four years as an elected school board member. I also served under Dr. Holliday as the Associate Commissioner for Leadership and School Improvement. And during that uh, time when I worked for KDE, my main job was to work with lower performing schools across the state and also districts and to help them uh, get to where they needed to be. So we worked really closely with the Kentucky Association of School Councils, with KSBA and various groups to try to help those schools. So I've seen a lot of effective councils. I've seen a lot of ineffective councils. I've seen effective districts and ineffective districts. And one thing that I would say those that are effective have in common is there is voice and collaboration among all of those groups. And also including the business community. Business partnerships are extremely important. And as Senator Sheckle pointed out, they are represented when they elect our school board members. So I'll speak specifically to the two topics that he mentioned. Curriculum is what we teach. It's, it's the very basis. Student, teacher, and curriculum are the three most important things that uh, go into a child's education. And so selection of the curriculum has to be a coherent, cohesive uh, prob uh, uh, solution to the problems that we find in our classrooms. And what we have now currently, when left up to councils, a council could select a book series and then the next grade level ahead of them, the middle school could select another series and it's just disjointed. So what I feel like and what I've seen work very well is at the district level to facilitate conversations with councils, facilitate conversations with the community, with the school board, and that could still really be achieved well if you have an effective process in place of collaboration, but once again, led from the district level. So across the district, all of our students have an equal opportunity. All of our students, especially those students that are transient, and we have more and more of them, they are the ones that are missing out when they move from school to school and they don't find that cohesiveness in the curriculum. They miss big chunks as they move from one grade level to the other. The other thing that I'd like to say is since councils, and I was actually a teacher prior to CARA, and was in a district that was one of the first districts to elect councils and to use councils in, after the 1990 CARE Reform Act. 
at that point, I believe a lot of community members, a lot of parents were very interested in running for councils. And over the years, my, over the course of my 12 years as a principal in three different uh, districts, I can count on my hand the number of times a parent came to a council meeting, even though they were widely advertised, and even though we many times had to uh, beg and twist arms to get people to run for the council. Uh, what I find and what has been true in all of the work that I've done in Kentucky schools is that principals are usually the first stop, the teacher and the principal. That's where the parent goes. They don't come to the council, and I think that was the original intent, uh, great intent to get parents involved, but I think parents mostly identify with that principal and then with the superintendent and then with the school board. And all of our school boards across Kentucky hear from parents on a, on a very regular basis. Superintendents and principals entertain uh, parents in, in meetings and task force and groups all of the time. So I think the intent of getting those parents involved um, has not bared fruit as, as we thought it would. The other thing that superintendents are always uh, looking at is continuous improvement. And in our accountability system, it doesn't matter where you are. The point is growth. And once again, a student and a, a school can't grow if they are selecting curricular materials every other year that are in conflict with one another. So again, that cohesive pr approach is really important. In our district and in many districts, that alignment is from preschool all the way through the college years. Our local JCTC campus, we have uh, many, many students that have dual credit courses. And so we're not just working in isolation within a school through a school council. We are working from preschool through the advanced level courses that students take and many of them leave with an associate's degree or many many courses that uh, count toward their college education. Of course principal selection is a concern. I can tell you uh, pretty firsthand and most recently this past summer I was part of a council that selected a principal for Simpsonville Elementary which is a very high performing school in our district. It was actually, I believe, the model of what principal selection should look like. But I can tell you, if the superintendent is given the authority to select the principal, I probably wouldn't change anything. The process of collaboration is the key, and that's what worked. We did surveys to find out what kind of characteristics parents were looking for, teachers were looking for, and student input what they were looking for. We took all of those characteristics and as a council together, not with me leading, but as a part of that council, we selected interview questions. We called through applications. We did the interviews and we did reach consensus. But through the whole process, my fear was, what if we didn't reach consensus? And I have the responsibility for taking this new principal that the council selects and making them into a great leader for Shelby County Public Schools. And then I'm responsible for their budget. I'm responsible for their uh, following all of the laws and regulations and policies that principals and school leaders need to be aware of. I'm also then responsible for that leadership and that school is, if it's improving or not, to my school board that actually evaluates me. So that principal selection process worked very well, but I can tell you it was the collaboration that was key. And I think what we can do is take what is working across Kentucky and codify that. Take what all of the high performing and high flying districts are doing that is working to include parents, to include students, the biggest stakeholder, and then also our business community and take that collaboration and codify that through some types of processes where everybody has that voice. But at the end of the day, the superintendent needs to have that final say after collaboration. 
I also wanted to say that the balance between the power, the authority, whatever word you want to use, with councils, with principals, with superintendents, and then with school boards, in my experience, with working, again, with low-performing schools, when it's a fight between who is responsible for what, we get disjointed and uh, ineffective policies. A council can decide what their goals are going to be for the year. They can decide their school motto. They can decide everything about their school, even if that is in direct conflict with what school board school boards have set as their goals. So that disjointedness is one of the things that I have encountered over that number of years serving in school leadership that I believe we can work together through collaboration and through public input, through parent input, uh, to help make it a more cohesive system where we're all working together. A principal gets to select their teachers and recommend them to the superintendent for final hiring. They do that in collaboration with the council, consultation with the council. And I think a model very similar to that for a superintendent to, with consultation with the council and working in collaboration, but again, having that final say for hiring that principal would be very effective. Whether this bill passes or whether things change, my practices won't change. The collaboration that I've enjoyed over the years with my constituents in the district, my uh, teachers in the buildings for where I've been principal, and those that I've worked with have all helped me to make the best decisions for students. And so that's what I would like to leave you with is the collaboration and the input is the key. And I think at the end of the day, someone has to have that final say uh, through collaboration and through working with all of those groups. I believe that should be the superintendent and then ultimately the school board. I want to thank you for the time that you've given to this topic because it is a very important topic to all school leaders across Kentucky. Thank you for your testimony. <laughs> I'm Brenda Jackson, currently a school board member, Shelby County Public Schools. This is starting my year 33. I've served 32 years on the board. I've been uh, chair several times. I've been on the KSBA Board of Directors. I've been past president of the Kentucky School Board Association. And I've gone through selection with other board members of several superintendents and happy to say that we have an excellent superintendent that we've chosen this time. I don't have children in the school system, but when I came on the board, I had adopted brothers that were 19 years younger than I was. And the difference between what my parents chose to question and what they chose not to question bothered me. And in one of those instances, and that's why I'm on the board, the school system, the central office, and the school where one of my younger brothers was, who was, I think that almost every school has one of those that no matter what you tell them to do, they're going to challenge. So if you have to be in your seat at 8 o'clock, at 7.59, he's standing in the doorway waiting for the bell to ring. And with several different things that he had done, they convinced my father that if he had so many tardies within the first couple of months of school, he would withdraw. And I had an issue with that. When I went to the board to ask a question, they told me that the decision was made and there was nothing that could be said or done. And I'm thinking that parents or the <clears throat> community in general had a right to ask a question to appear before the board to uh, voice their opinion. So I ran, I lost several times, but I ended up uh, being elected to the school board. 
the issues that we have today and a concern that I have is with principal selection and uniform curriculum because I found over the years being on the board that councils had the right to basically request the list of what or who they wanted to be their principal and what they would do even if the superintendent uh, gave them a list of qualified they could deny uh, everybody on that list and keep requesting until they got the person that they wanted and they chose that person but in the end if that person didn't work out if the school wasn't successful if the students weren't achieving then it was left up to the superintendent to go through the procedure to replace that person as the principal. And I didn't think that it was fair to the superintendent to have to come in and try to clear up a mistake that had been made earlier. And so that was one of the things, and I look at this, that with the collaboration and with working with the council that it would be good to have your superintendent because they're familiar with the whole system and not just that school to be able to work toward uh, selecting the principal. The other thing was curriculum. Shelby County is really a mobile county. We've got uh, a lot of students that go from school to school and some of them are losing ground when they change schools because we don't have consistency in that curriculum. And what happens, uh, some of the students, and I've had the parents complain to me and even the students that they're, if they go to a different school, they're repeating what they've already learned or else they're advanced to the point where they've lost something that they don't know. So I think that we really do need some consistency between the schools with what the curriculum is and I do think that it's uh, important for as the superintendent said collaboration between the superintendent the principal the board members and all of us to uh, have say in what the curriculum is going to be not just to say what they're going to do but to look at the fact that if our students are going to be mobile then if we're going from one school to the next, they need to be able to keep on track and to be able to succeed and advance and not to go back or just be at a standstill. So I thank you for that and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. I'll just briefly, sir, uh, just for the record, I'll introduce myself. I'm Eric Kennedy with the Kentucky School Boards Association. I'll just not to, not belabor all of the good things that have been shared so far. I just want to thank you for hearing this bill today. Thank you for making this a priority. I believe uh, several of you in other places recently have said that every every topic, every bill sometimes uh, has its time and has its day that comes. We have talked about this, uh, some of these pieces for many, many years. And I think in, a, in statute, part of that CARA law from 1990 really established this overall statement of here's what we want all of our students to be able to do and what our school should do for them. And in order to make that happen, everyone involved has to be working together and collaborating. And I think that's exactly true now, and that's really kind of at the heart of what uh, this bill uh, is trying to get to. So we just appreciate it uh, so much in your consideration. Eric, thank you for your, for your words and testimony as well. Senator Chickle, I, I do have uh, some groups and individuals who have signed up in opposition. Before I do take questions from committee members to you, I would like to allow them to be able to voice. Now, my committee, in terms of being the chairman, what I've always had is my policy of those that have signed up to be guests uh, are allowed to testify in opposition. And so I have Liz Irwin from the Kentucky Association of School Councils. I also have from the Kentucky Education Association, Eddie Campbell and Toby Cable. I may be mispronouncing the lot. Thank you very much. So if you all would make your way to the table, please, and you can present your testimony, it will be greatly appreciated. Good morning, Liz. Good morning. Please proceed. 
Thank you. I'm with the Kentucky Association of School Councils, and we are in opposition to this bill. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today. I'd like to offer you a few thoughts about Senate Bill 1 from my perspective as an educator for over 20 years, most recently as a school level administrator for eight years at two different high performing elementary schools, most recently as a principal of Paint Lake Elementary in Gary County, and then prior to that I was at Woodlawn Elementary in Boyle County. I'd also like to share a couple of examples where Senate Bill 1 would result in terrible outcomes for our students. High performing schools and districts like the ones that I have worked in use data and evidence based strategies to increase student achievement and close gaps. There is no data that supports the dismantling of SBDM leadership as, as, as Senate Bill 1 will do. Councils are perfect examples of true local decision making in a place where it is, it is most needed in our schools. In a time when we are placing a high value on local decision making and are opposing the practice of mandates being pushed on us from above, I'm not sure why we would want to dismantle the most local of governance, our school councils. The voices from those closest to our students should be those that we value the most. Here's an example of how the bill would harm our schools. Regarding the changes proposed in the selection of curriculum, it would have really hurt my school if the power to choose our curriculum was given solely to one person at the top of our district. For the curriculum to be implemented well, teachers need to have a true voice in deciding it. It is already common practice for schools in the same district to collaborate and adopt the same curriculum led by district administrators and in many cases the instructional materials as well. These processes are outlined in a council's policies. This collaboration creates the buy-in necessary for teachers to implement the curriculum with fidelity. Instead of facilitating this process, this law would force a one-size-fits-all approach and eliminate the teacher voice and the collaboration. If our new math curriculum we developed together in my district this year had been simply chosen for the teachers without their direct involvement in shaping it, the initiatives would have failed. Also, for successful implementation of curriculum, teachers need to be involved in its development. That's how teachers learn how to translate those state standards into instruction. When teachers and school leaders are involved in curriculum work, they internalize the standards and content. Successful implementation is dependent upon direct involvement. If the changes proposed in Senate Bill 1 were to pass, we would also lose the effective collaboration process of principal selection. When you enter a school as a new principal, as I did just a few years ago, one of your first priorities is to build relationships with your school community. As I sat in what became my school's library, getting in interviewed by a retired teacher, members of the council, including a parent who spoke limited English, and the superintendent, I received a glimpse into the special community I would be joining at Paint Lick. The council and the superintendent together became the bridge that eased my transition into what became our school. I went into a new position with a foundation of success already laid out because I had the support of the superintendent and the leadership from my staff and community. The opportunity for input for multiple, from multiple perspectives should not be replaced by the decisions of one person who is removed from the school. Please let your actions today tell us that you are truly value local decision making, stakeholder input, and what is best for our schools. Please stop Senate Bill 1. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony.
we're out today and I didn't have any kids to yell at, I'm going to come yell at you all. <laughs> you have some kids who are in the yell at. Can I go to the restroom, please? <laughs> Put your hand down. It hadn't even been 10 minutes. Please identify yourself to the record. You may proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairman Wise. Uh, and members of the committee, my name is Eddie Campbell. Uh, I'm a middle and high school music teacher from Knox County, uh, currently serving as president of the Kentucky Education Association. Uh, KEA represents over 43,000 active educators, education support professionals, retired educators, and aspiring educators in every school and community across the Commonwealth. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, on this issue today. Uh, I'm here today to speak in opposition of Senate Bill 1. Uh, KEA strongly strongly supports meaningful, direct parent and teacher involvement in the important leadership decisions that are made in our public schools. Senate Bill 1 would hinder that involvement, and I encourage you to vote no on this bill. Today I have with me uh, Ms. Jody Cabble. Cabble. I, I always mispronounce that. <laughs> but Babble, so my um, say. A social studies and government teacher from Henry Clay High School in Lexington, Kentucky. Ms. Cabell serves, uh, has served as an elected teacher representative on the school-based decision-making councils at Henry Clay High School for many years, and she is currently a certified SBDM trainer. I had hoped to also have with me uh, Ms. Leanne Lewis, an English teacher, uh, English and language arts teacher from Simon Kenton High School in Independence, Kentucky. Uh, but because of the sub shortage, she was unable uh, to attend in person today. And since we didn't have a virtual uh, t uh, option for testimony, um, as she writ wrote a statement and we have provided it uh, to all the members of the committee. So you should have that. Uh, since the General Assembly passed the Kentucky Education Reform Act in 1990, SBDM councils have been an essential driver in student success, opportunity, and growth. According to KDE, uh, data from KDE, 7,625 Kentucky citizens are currently serving on school-based councils and are school-based school -based council members uh, all across the Commonwealth. That group is, is made up of parents who are elected by their peers, teachers who are elected by their colleagues, and principals who are currently selected by both the council and the superintendent together. Because council membership is compro comprised of representatives of the education community in the buildings and parents who have at least one child receiving instruction in that building and the principal who is the instructional leader in that school, school-based councils are uniquely qualified to understand the school population, the school culture, the school needs, and the issues that the students of the schools face every single day. This group of dedicated educators and parents led by the school principal adopt policies to facilitate individual student success. Their voices should be lifted up and listened to more, not sidestep or undermined. SBDM, uh, sorry, <laughs> SB1 or Senate Bill 1 uh, would, uh, is a backwards step for Kentucky public schools. SBDM councils are and have been for many years now the best example of true and direct local control in our public schools. The provisions of SB1 do not move Kentucky public schools forward. Instead, the bill limits constituent voice, clouds transparency, and throws a veil of secrecy over the important leadership decisions and concentrates all of that power in the superintendent. KEA strongly in uh, encourages each of the members of this distinguished committee to vote no on this bill. Uh, I would like to now turn it over uh, to Ms. Cabell for a few comments. I'm going to be really short because my husband's from Eastern Kentucky and he says if I don't get to the Kroger really quick they're going to run out of milk and bread. So <laughs> I'm going to be real quick. But thank you for hearing from me. I think it's important. I'm a government teacher so being able to have a voice has been great. I've been here before. We've, we've done this before and I will tell you this. I uh, live in a district that has over 70 schools and programs. In my 22 years in Fayette County, I've had, if you count the interim superintendent, I've had 11 superintendents. And I do not believe that they are in a better position to know exactly what each one of those local community schools need. Every school is its own community. And I think that that is what Kara was trying to do and that nobody is more invested, intentionally invested in a school being successful than the students. 
and the teachers and the parents who, who work and go to school there. Um, all of you can point to a teacher who has made a, a change in, in your life in some way, I bet. And all of you have thanked teachers in May, that first week of May, Teacher Appreciation Week, and you have said, we are important, we do the most important job, we teach the future. And in a committee where lots of people have supported bills that believe in individual freedom, like masking and vaccinations and where you carry your gun, the fact that you don't trust teachers and parents to pick their principals in consultation with the superintendent is a little bit offensive. Shame on some of you, really. The irony of where I sit isn't lost on this government teacher. We are in the seat of the capital of the Commonwealth. This is where representative government is supposed to be supported. And there should be more seats being added to the table. And I feel like this bill takes seats away. Collaboration, Dr. Suggs, who I have to say this, said that she never had a, a meeting where uh, lots of parents came. She obviously never tried to eliminate a band program. And, um, but, but she talked about this idea of collaboration. The way that the site-based council is structured now guarantees that collaboration. Senate Bill 1 would make that collaboration at the whim of a superintendent and I have had 11 of them, and some of them have been awesome, and we didn't need to have a site-based council rules and regulations, but some of them, they, they were protecting the, the local schools and the autonomy uh, of those schools and doing what was best for those individual schools. Every school is different, and there has to be collaboration, but Senate Bill 1 doesn't guarantee it, it takes it away. This decision, this decision is so important, and it also shows that that you actually believe what you say that the more local and the more intentional and the smaller you can make government the better off we are okay and if there's a superintendent that doesn't think they have authority or power to work with the principal that they didn't choose come find a teacher we work with people all the time that we didn't get to pick and we're expected to help them and make them better and improve on what they're doing every day I would be happy to train any superintendent that needs that. I'm actually certified to do it. And that is all I have to say. Thank you so much. Be careful driving home. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your comments. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you again, Senator Lars. I'm going to allow one more testimony. This is the last one because this person did contact LRC to be signed up, even though they were not here in time that I took up the form. Gay Adelman, if you would proceed. We do have to still take questions and testimony on this bill and vote. We still have another bill that's still on the agenda for today. I will ask that you please keep your comments brief as we already have had testimony against the bill. Thank you. Proceed. Thank you. And I do appreciate you uh, letting me speak today. Most of you know me. My name is Gay Adelman, and most of you know me from my work in public education advocacy with Save Our Schools Kentucky and Dear JCPS. But you may not know, I've been an involved and engaged parent long before uh, moving to Kentucky. My boys are now 24 and 26. I've been a booster mom, a PTA president, chairperson of councils and fundraising committees, and a district-wide PTA officer in eight different school districts in four different states. I also taught K through eight computer classes for two years in a private school in Lilly, Kentucky. So I've seen it all, private, public. Um, I've, I've also been made aware because of my experiences that Kentucky is a leader and we've been very fortunate to have uh, been a leader in education reform. And site-based decision-making councils may not be perfect, but please don't throw our babies out with the bathwater. I'm here today as chair of the Coalition for the People's Agenda Education Committee. Our All History Matters When Black History Matters campaign is primarily focused on stopping House Bill 14 and House Bill 18. I understand that's not what we're here to talk about today, but this bill is intended to weaken site-based decision-making councils, which is the argument that many of the those who are in favor of the bill to ban the teaching of accurate history in our schools needs to know that there's a process that they can participate in. And so by taking away, weakening site-based decision-making councils, you're strengthening your House Bill 14 and 18. And this truly feels like a ploy to undermine our efforts. Uh, last time you heard from changes to site-based decision-making councils a couple of years ago, uh, we had a sick out in Jefferson County and thousands of us descended upon this Capitol to slow the, the movement of that bill. There was testimony and bipartisan support 
for adding a parent to the site-based decision-making councils as a solution to one of the problems that we faced in our in our uh, schools and in our districts. The problems that have been identified by those in favor of the bill are real, but that doesn't mean that the solutions that have been proposed are the solutions. And you haven't heard from the parents and the community members and the taxpayers who actually will be impacted by these changes. And uh, even JCPS has not notified their current site-based decision-making council members that there will be changes. So I ask you, I implore you to please slow this bill down and make sure that you've heard from both sides what those possible challenges to this bill would be as well as possible solutions because there is no data to show that this bill is the solution to the problems that we've been raising for over a decade in our district. Site-based decision-making councils could be impacted by a more equitable student assignment plan, for example. I sat here two years ago and showed Ms. you Adam, a map. I ask that you please come to a, a, a close Ten seconds. Andy, thank you so much. I thank sat you. here t uh, that, that day and showed you a map that showed you that our student assignment plan has inequity, inequitably impacted our schools in our west part of our community. And if taking away the decision-making power is the solution, why hasn't it helped our West Louisville schools? Because that's been done for over a decade. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Questions from committee members? Senator Givens, <clears throat> Senator Schickel, if you may want to make your way back to the table. Senator Schickel, thanks for the legislation. You and I have talked about this um, multiple times. I, I want you to reiterate for the committee again, the, the concern was raised a few moments ago that this is too soon, too fast, and moving too quickly. How many years have you been pursuing this? Six or seven. Six or seven years. Mm -hmm. Diversions, have they changed substantially over the six or seven years? Not substantially. What was the original premise? Walk us briefly through that evolution and, and what may or may not have changed in the legislation this year relative to those other years. Um, the evolution of the... Um, of the bill, it's, I'm not, I don't serve on the education uh, uh, committee, uh, but I drive a school bus and my partner is a retired uh, teacher. And when I got involved in this, she was an active teacher. And uh, so I was around, I was in the schools a lot and I was around uh, the educational uh, in our schools. And uh, so I was listening and talking and the idea from this bill came from teachers and parents because I couldn't fathom a system like this where the person who was ultimately <coughs> responsible for the performance didn't have the tools in the toolbox to change it. When a school is not performing well, we don't say, well, we don't run, the average citizen doesn't go to the site-based council and know about the site-based council. They look at the superintendent. Well, the first they look at the principal they look at the superintendent and they wonder why their elected officials, the school board, who, and that's why the testimony about this somehow takes away local control. The, the school board is the ultimate local control elected by all the citizens of that school district. And uh, so that's the foundation of the bill. But we've made changes. We've uh, added people to the site-based council. We subtracted people to the site-based council. The biggest change we made is we've narrowed the focus. We've narrowed the focus to two things. You know there's a lot in that chapter about site-based councils and school boards. But the two most important things are curriculum. And as the previous testimony described, people are very interested in curriculum these days. Very interested. And there was a lot of confusion on who was ultimately responsible. Um, my own superintendent, well, he's retired now, but my own superintendent, who has been a champion of this bill, as well as several principals and teachers in my district, um, th they, um, they actually uh, got in trouble with the Office of e Educational Accountability because there was confusion on who is ultimately responsible for the decisions being made, whether it was just because citizens would go to the school board, they'd send them to the site-based council, then the site-based council would go, well, oh, that's actually, and so it, it, there, there was no clear accountability. And in any organization, like the superintendent from Shelby, so well, so well, I think articulated, our whole panel did, I couldn't have done it any better, but 
the, um, you're not going to be around in today's society if you don't seek collaboration. You have to collaborate to lead. The PTA, the site-based council, you're just not going to be around. But at the end of the day, any organization has to have someone be able to make a decision. And it has to be the people who are directly accounted, accountable to the taxpayers, the parents and everyone else. And uh, so for me, this bill, its concept is pretty simple. Um, and uh, as you, you I, I've talked to you a lot about it, and I thank you for all your help with guidance, mentoring, or, or Senate leadership, because at times over those six, seven years, I got pretty discouraged. But uh, that's kind of walking you from day one up to the present day. So, Mr. Chairman, brief follow-up. <clears throat> Rhetorical question, but I, I need you to answer it. I'm confident in the answer because we've had this conversation as well. But under, under current Kentucky law, with the authority that's invested in a site-based decision-making council, if I, as a taxpayer, do not have a child in that school building that the SBDM oversees, I'm paying the taxes. I have no voice in the curriculum. Is that correct? That is correct, and it's a great question. And a follow-up, if I might add to that, I th because I think it, it's, uh, it's down the weeds a lip, but I think it's also very pertinent that a person can be on the site-based council and not even live in that school district and not even live in that state. And we've had that happen in our, um, in, in our school district. Um, I take issue with the fact that this bill um, uh, eliminates or, or I think it makes site-based councils the important tool for parents and teachers that needs to be there. And any superintendent that or, or principal knows, we, or the state center or anything, <laughs> the days of doing your job without collaboration, those are over, especially in a position like that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Also, members, just want to briefly note, staff alerted me, in your folders, we also have Senator Thomas, who's not here, provided a statement on behalf of the student voice team in opposition of Senate Bill 1. Just want to make sure in your folders you are uh, noticed of that. Senator West, question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Um, talking to our able-bodied help here on the podium, uh, I think CARE was 1990. When it first came out um, 32 years ago that's that's a long time uh, the SBDMs were part of that you know care process change uh, but but that was a wholesale change those were wholesale changes in 1990 and um, I think it's safe to say that they changed the trajectory of education in Kentucky for the better um, but as part of that wholesale change some of those changes were good some were bad some in between and as you know, you've been around for a long time. You know, the one constant is change. And we need to be constantly trying to improve education, constant improvement. Um, so we, I think those who have spoken against it, this bill, you, everybody is pushing towards the same goal. We want education on the upward trajectory uh, in Kentucky. Educational standings. 50 states there are you can argue over which group you're using but there we're approximately in the middle and there are a certain number of states above us of those states to your knowledge what other states currently use the sbdm model like we have here in kentucky no other no other okay um to me when you talk local control, that's a good thing. Uh, but school boards, in my opinion, are, are complete local control. Um, it's one thing to have a say, but it's another thing to be able to vote on who's on the school board. Uh, and I disagree totally that parents don't have a say. Parents can run for school board. Parents can vote for school board. And I hope that all school boards would listen to parents, whether it's curriculum, what, um, principal, uh, choosing the principal, choosing the staff. Um, hopefully, 
all school boards will continue to listen to parents' voices when these important issues come forward. And I, I think this bill eliminates a lot of confusion in the um, the chain chain of command. You know, the buck the buck stops here. You know, how can a leader of a school district be held accountable when they have no control over little to no control over who who is uh, in the chain of command below them in, in middle management, so to speak. So I think this is a good bill. It doesn't do away with SBDMs. They're still in place, um, but it, it is clarification. Uh, I think parents still have a say and, and a tremendous say in, in schools, maybe even more so. So I thank you for the bill. Senator Meredith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, I have a question for uh, Mr. Campbell, if he could. Uh return Thanks, sir. appreciate your testimony uh, about KEA's, KEA's position on this but you made the statement that KEA supports direct parent involvement this is my sixth session in Central Circle the sixth time I've, I've heard this bill and on numerous other occasions we've had uh, parents added teachers deleted and back and forth but one of the problems I have with this bill is that we're not adjusting, adjusting the membership and there's still only two parents as, as compared to four educators. And I think that's one of the impediments to parent uh, involvement in this. So if KEA supports direct parent involvement, would you support adding additional parents to site-based councils? We support making sure that we have all the voices at the table. So parents, students, even our classified workers need a seat at that table to have those conversations about the this decisions that are being made for that school. Well, I appreciate that previously y'all have not sort of supported that position. As a matter of fact, I can remember testimony against adding additional parents to a site base. So are you saying your position on that has changed? Well, I'd have to take it to my board. Uh, we don't have time to take it to the board. Uh, we're going <laughs> to move on this thing and uh, I'm considering but an amendment bill, to the bill. As, we, as presented today, doesn't do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Neal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know the time is short, so I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. You know, I've been, I've been here since uh, CURE was initiated, and I have always been ambivalent about the way this thing was set up from the beginning. However, we have found out over the years that there was great value that was achieved through the construction of the site-based decision-making councils and shifting some of the, uh, you call it the decision-making authority uh, to those councils. At the same time, I've been challenged because I could see situations where uh, some of the arguments been made here today, uh, Senator Schickel. Um, clearly, um, in certain circumstances, I think, uh, require uh, a certain type of accountability and a certain amount of, of coordination sometimes comes from one person having the responsibility of making certain things happen. So that's been sort of the ambivalence, the basis of the ambivalence I've had. My, my problem, uh, and understand, this is not new. This thing has been raging since the very beginning. This is not a new question. It's not a new issue. Uh, that question of what's the correct balance in this piece uh, has been toyed with, has been worked with, and so forth. And I'm not sure we found the right balance, and I don't think there is any perfection in whatever system's put in place. But I'm not sure that, um, and this is with all due respect, for you. You're very thoughtful, and I know you've been very tenacious about this, and there's a, very, uh, a lot of substance in the arguments that uh, have led you here, and I appreciate and respect that. But I'm not sure we have not, um, uh, it's almost ironically, have taken away the parental involvement more so in this situation uh, because we centralized authority without exception in one individual. That gives me some concern when I think about where we came from. So here's where I am. I'm wondering if there is the possibility of, again, revisiting this with all the 
individuals that have the arguments and see if we can come to a solution without throwing that piece out because I think it's a valuable thing to have that input you know on that level and of course I think it's a valuable thing uh, particularly when it gets to the appointment of, of principals it gets into a, an, an issue from times because you can't get political on some of these councils they're not perfect but some of them do very well so I'm wondering if there's a middle ground somewhere, if you've considered that middle ground and, and whether or not there's still an opportunity for middle ground. Well, I always enjoy your questions. And uh, uh, the, um, I was just thinking we had an interim hearing and a session hearing because the Senate's passed this legislation numerous times. So we've had an interim here probably eight, ten times. I can't think of an issue where we've had more hearings and more discussion I think there's some honest disagreement, and uh, I respect uh, both sides, and I agree with you that probably is no perfect governance model, um, but I would, uh, I feel confident that what is working, I think Senator West said it best, it's, you can't, something as critical as this, you can't have confusion, and right now we have confusion, and you know, and we all know that sometimes people purposely create confusion, and that's unfortunate. But that's why so often you have to have a, a, a clear cut, a, 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 a simple process that's forthright. So, so uh, I, I just think we have some honest disagreement. I think we've come to a pretty good bill. We've made a lot of compromise. The original bill didn't have had a lot of other things that site-based councils do, such as facility management, which they're still doing. Uh, if you, I was amazed, and if you read the statute, there's lots of things site-based councils do by statute that they're still going to be continue on doing. Uh, so, so to me, this is a compromise, and I think it's a good bill, and I'd like to move forward with it after seven years. If I may briefly. Please proceed. So would you concede, then, that there are successful site-based um, models that exist now that produce uh, the desired results of what we've intended them to do? Are mm -hmm. there any? Well, I, I, I guess I would answer that no, because... Um, uh, I think we have a lot of successful schools with site-based councils, but I don't think the reason for their success is the current um, legal makeup of the site-based council. I think the reason for their success is what the superintendent said, is good collaboration uh, between the superintendent, which this bill still encourages completely and doesn't encourage, requires. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, just like you said, or, or, or maybe it was someone else, uh, someone has to make a decision. Brief comment. I think your no is a yes if you really examine what you just said. What you're really saying here is that you have models here that have created schools that are produced and, and achieved, and yet you had site-based councils that were obviously intimately involved in the decision-making that produced this piece and then discounted them. I think your answer ultimately is that there's no room for uh, further review with respect to this bill. But I do appreciate you, and I appreciate your uh, sincerity with respect to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Um, seeing no further questions, but also being the chairman, I will hold my questions and comments for now. And this may be directed towards Ms. Irwin or also uh, Mr. Kennedy, but over the last especially two years, if we think about all of the major decisions we've had to make surrounding schools, starting, stopping, masking, not, hold back, do over, all the things that we have passed and have made decisions on, have those decisions been made locally at the school board level or with the site-based or school-based decision-making level? And I know that's just... It's a comment that leads into a question, but if but if we've seen as much policy that we've had come out of Frankfurt that have gone back to school districts, where's the governance and where's the decision making been on just those type of issues? I think generally uh, most of the topics that you just mentioned kind of generally uh, over the last couple of years have been decided at the school board level. I think in most cases that was because they were issues that involved the entire school district and not just any one school which has always been roughly where the split of the lines of authority have been, that things that were school specific were the council or things that might impact the entire district or liability at the district level were with the school board. And, and Ms. Irwin, if you can say, in terms of some of those decisions I just mentioned, 
has the site-based decision-making councils been in collaboration with school boards on their opinions about those policies and those procedures? In my experience, yeah, please. Okay. I apologize. It's okay. In my experience, in my limited, you know, district, no, it's been the superintendent, and the and it, you know, I've heard a lot about collaboration today, and a lot, you know, collaboration is very, very important, but. If it's just one person, like the superintendent, it really depends on that person's willingness to collaborate. But we're not saying that there's not been collaboration in terms of school boards listening to site-based members, correct, on issues such as this? I think there's been a historic and good level, but a historic high level of constituent engagement and collaboration with school boards over all of these things uh, for the past couple of years. Uh, we've seen in a lot of meetings, and I can just tell you emails and texts and phone calls, uh, school board members um, trying to shop at Kroger and trying to go to church and hearing all about it. So I think there's been a lot of that community-wide um, outreach and discussion in general. Okay. Perfect. Thank you both for your comments. Seeing no further questions, we have a motion on Senate Bill 1. As amended by the sub, we have a motion by Senator Givens. Do we have a second? second. We have a second from Senator West. Mariah, if you would, please call the roll. Senator Carroll. I'd like to vote aye and explain my vote. Please proceed. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate all the testimony here today, and uh, Senator Schickel, I appreciate your work on this bill. And I, I really don't see where this is going to diminish the, the site-based decision-making council at all in today's environment. And uh, I cannot imagine the frustration of any superintendent who is tasked with the success of entire district but yet lacks the ability to affect major change within his or her district. Um, coming from a position of running an organization as a CEO, uh, and our programs include early childhood education. And for me to be successful, I have to have input from all different levels, from all different programs, and I have to take that into consideration because they know what's going on uh, at the level that actually makes the difference in the classroom. So. Uh, I think any superintendent worth their salt is going to continue the collaboration. Uh, however, it does make one individual ultimately responsible, and I think that is in the best interest of the entire district when that happens. And I think any superintendent is going to know that uh, schools within their district are different, and you make adaptations uh, depending on the population that you're serving in that district and what the struggles are within that school. Uh, so uh, I vote for I for the bill, and I think it's going to be a, a welcome change. And I know this is uh, most of the teachers uh, within my district probably oppose this, uh, but I think it's what's best for our kids. And for us to get to that next level, there has to be a different level of a performance and a different level of accountability. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Givens. Senator Harper Angel. Senator Higdon, Aye. Senator Kerr, Senator Meredith. I'll explain my vote, please. Please proceed. I vote aye and for a lot of different reasons, but uh, one of the driving ones today is the testimony of Ms. Brenda Jackson, 33 years in her position, and you are an epitome of public service, and I appreciate you being here and the commitment that you made to this. You know, you're there for no reason other than you want to see the betterment for education. I appreciate your testimony today, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Senator Neal. Uh, I'd like to explain my no vote. Please proceed. Um, you know, I don't think there's a perfection that we can find here. I don't want to, and I don't, I feel uncomfortable with the edge of denigration in terms of comments made. I think everybody in the system whether they're teachers, whether they're uh, superintendents, uh, whether they're custodians, uh, are well-intended. I take that as a given that they're trying to do things for the welfare of our children. And I think there's no panacea, and I think there's no uh, fixed or generalized approach to it that's going to solve every problem. But I do think, and I think even what's being offered here can be it will work in many situations. I hope it does not become a negative in other situations. Uh, on the other hand, I think there are great uh, successes that are demonstrated by the current applications uh, or modifications in some instances of site-based councils in uh, particular districts. 
And uh, I don't think we can take a uh, just a, a sweep and say, you know, that's not important. It is important. It's important, the, the authority, the placement of authority, the decision making, and it varies from place to place. To think that one person is well intended to get it done, I agree with that. But it doesn't always work out that way. So I think there's middle ground. I think more discussions needed. So I'm going to vote no, at least at this time, uh, for that purpose. Thank you. Senator Southworth. Explain my vote, Mr. Chairman. Please proceed. I'm going to be voting yes today. Um, I have heard a lot of complaints from a lot of my districts relating to this issue. And as was already mentioned, I don't want to reiterate everything that's already been said, but the org chart of an organization is to me of utmost importance because every time I've ever had a bad experience, it's always, in an organization, it's always a function of chain of command issues. Nobody knows who's responsible. Nobody knows who they can go to when they have an issue. And nobody knows how to solve a problem. And therefore, problems just languish and never get solved. And I see that our education system is replete with problems that everybody wants to solve, but nobody can figure out how to do that. Now, that said, I don't know that we're getting there uh, with this bill. I think there's a lot of things we could be doing. Certainly, they're not all in this bill. Um, but the one thing that I find interesting is that we have these boards who they're volunteers, they're, they're elected officials, they come in once a month for policy, and they have their executive director, if you will, um, the superintendent who's supposed to be doing all of the day-to-day -day stuff. And I think that's a that's a compelling argument because how do we get all of these volunteer boards? I've worked in volunteer boards long enough to know it's hard to get all this together. So I'm going to vote yes today, but I'm hoping that we can move this forward just enough to get a little bit more discussion and bring people to the table to say we've got to redo this site-based council. We need more parents on this council. I'm voting for that easily. Somebody bring that bill. I'm voting for it, and it needs to be in this bill, really. So let's get that moving to make a really good change. That's why I'm voting yes. Thank you. Senator Stivers. Aye. Senator Thomas. Senator West. Aye. Senator Wilson. Aye. Chair Wise. Vote aye. Uh, by a margin of nine to one, the bill does proceed and it does pass. It'll move on from here. I want to thank both sides today for their testimony uh, on education bills. Uh, always appreciate uh, when we can have civil conversations and bring everyone to the table. So thank you all for presenting today and uh, thank you for your testimony. The next item on our agenda today is Senate Bill 25. Senate Bill 25 is, uh, I am the primary sponsor of that. I'm just going to stay in this chair to present the bill. Uh, to make it easier given our, our time frame that we're under. Senate Bill 25, uh, the purpose of the bill is to prioritize in-person learning by extending the 2021 special session uh, to the Senate Bill 1 components that have expired through uh, December 31st. It was uh, given to us from the special session uh, that we had uh, that dealt with COVID-19. Uh, I do have a committee sub that is on the bill, and if I would, I would like a motion on the sub motion made by Senator West and there's a second by Senator Meredith and uh, what you have presented in front of you is the committee sub and basically uh, the committee sub just allows the provisions within the bill uh, that they, they shall be retroactive to June 1st of 2022 uh, since we were already uh, past that date and the school year started but this is one of those issues that we said during the special session uh, we would have to revisit and we would have to come back uh, because we need to provide flexibility to school districts uh, we are right now uh, under a, f a winter situation, but we also have uh, COVID-19 with the variant that's out there, uh, with flu. We have a whole other situations that are evolving. So basically what this bill does, there's a whole lot of things that already will remain into effect without having to re-up uh, some of the legislation that is before you. But the main provisions in this is for COVID-19 absences, and I repeat this for COVID-19 absences, that remote instruction may be temporarily provided to a particular school, grade, classroom, or group for no more than 10 days per school. Now that is not for the entire district. 
want to make sure everyone is aware for that. This is more of a, we, we called it in the special session, a surgical strike. That is the same type of wording that we're using today. But also this bill will allow for districts to hire uh, those retirees from KTRS uh, for either part or full-time certified or classified positions and who have completed a minimum required break in their employment of only one month. Now there is actual analysis that is provided for here. And I know that Senator Higdon is always one when we talk about pensions, we talk about retired teachers, there is no impact whatsoever of what is in this bill. I do want to emphasize that Bo Barnes has given uh, his approval. There's a letter in your packet there. So there's no impact whatsoever. And also this extends the hiring threshold from 1% to 10% of staff. Uh, I know that has also been of a major concern for school districts and superintendents and others. Uh, and I see the head shaking uh, in the audience of Superintendent uh, Dr. Suggs, who testified earlier, uh, that this would help then establish filling staff vacancies uh, that may be needed uh, during this time as we're evolving with COVID-19 as well. I first need, Senator Wilson, I appreciate my good friend Josh Collins that said I do need a voice vote on adopting the sub so with that before we take a motion on the bill do we have a, a voice vote of adopting the sub all any of those opposed motion carries we have a motion from senator wilson on senate bill 25 is there any questions before we ask for a second do we have a second on the senator neil i'm sorry i noticed in the bill you have 10 days on there has any consideration been given to expanding that to a larger number, like 20 or 25, given the difference in the districts and the... That is per school, not per district, is in the legislation. I'm sorry, per school, same thing, same question. Has any consideration been given? It? I guess what I'm asking is how do we arrive at 10? Basically, that was a collaboration of agreement upon many individuals working on the bill, listening to the associations of some of the needs and some of the want that were necessary for us to get the bill moving at this time. Okay, well, do you think there might be some consideration of expanding that on further discussion? You and I can have that discussion, but I will say, Senator Neal, where the bill stands right now, of we, we, we need to move quickly uh, in terms of the urgency of this, So, but I'm talk, happy to have that discussion. I can you. talk fast. Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Senator. Do we have a second on Senate Bill 25 as amended by the sub? Second by Senator Carroll. Mariah, if you would, please call the roll. Senator Carroll. Aye. Senator Givens. Aye. Senator Harper Angel. Senator Higdon. Aye. Senator Kerr. Aye. Senator Meredith. Aye. Senator Neal. I like to explain my vote. I'm going to reserve Please uh, proceed. my vote for the floor. Thank you. Senator Southworth. Aye. Senator Stivers. Aye. Senator Thomas. Senator West. Aye. Senator Wilson. Aye. Chair Wise. Aye. By 10 0 vote, Senate Bill 25 uh, passes and moves on. I want to thank everyone so much for their attendance today and uh, do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. So moved. Thank you all.